Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to thank you all for joining us for the Congressman's Tax Season webinar. My name is Brenda Lopez, caseworker for Congressman Tony Cardenas. We will begin this evening's presentation shortly. I would like to remind everyone that this presentation is being translated in Spanish. To listen to this presentation in Spanish, please hover over the globe at the bottom right of the Zoom. Me gustaría recordarles a todos que esta presentación está siendo traducida en español. Para escuchar esta presentación en español, por favor, coloque el curso sobre el globo en la parte derecha del Zoom. Please keep your cameras off and stay muted for the entirety of the event. While we allow time for others to join, I will give an overview of the agenda. In in a brief minute, you will hear opening remarks from Congressman Tony Cárdenas, Annabel Marquez, our IRS liaison. I will give a presentation and next, Luis Tejeda from the IRS Taxpayer Advocate Services will also give a presentation. Following the presentation, Annabel Marquez from the IRS and Luis Tejeda from TAS will answer your questions. If you're in need of the translation and presentation in Spanish, Spanish, please change your Zoom audio settings using the globe below. Please feel free to leave general questions in the chat. If your IRS concern is specific to your situation, please reach out to our district office at 818-221-3718. Our team of caseworkers are standing by to work with the IRS agency to address your concerns. Please find our office information in the chat box. For those of you just tuning in, thank you for joining us for our tax season webinar. As a reminder, please keep your cameras off and stay muted for the entirety of the event. At this time, I would like to give the floor to Congressman Tony Cardenas. Thank you, Brenda. Um, hello, uh, my name is Tony Cardenas and I have the honor of representing the Northeast San Fernando Valley in our United States Congress. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening to hear updates from the IRS and the Taxpayer Advocate Office. I wanna thank Luis Tejeda from the Taxpayer Advocate Service and Anabel Marquez from the IRS and also my casework team for organizing this event tonight to answer your questions. My constituent service team has worked with the uh, TAS to address constituents' issues with their missing tax returns, installment agreements, and today, they'll share with you the new updates from the 2024 direct file pilot program. Um, I'm gonna say a few words in Spanish as well. Buenas noches a todos y gracias por acompañarnos esta noche para escuchar las actualizaciones de la Oficina de Defensor del Contribuyente del IRS. Quiero agradecer a Anabel Márquez, Luis Tejeda, del Servicio de Defensa del Contribuyente y a mi equipo de trabajo de casos por organizar este evento hoy. Mi oficina ha trabajado en colaboración con la Oficina del Defensor del Contribuyente durante la pandemia para abordar los problemas de sus declaraciones de impuestos pendientes, estatus de pagos de cheque de estímulo, pagos de créditos fiscales por hijos, acuerdos y a plazos y hoy compartir compartirán con usted las nuevas actualizaciones de su programa piloto direct direct file 2024 también quiero acordarles varias cosas si sí pueden hacer preguntas esta noche en español y también van a poder um, responder en español también y si hay algo que necesitan mis mi oficina está disponible para ayudarles nunca 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 uh, pidemos información como si son ciudadanos, indocumentados, etc. Mi oficina está aquí para servir a todos. The Inflation Reduction Act of 2022 was a hugely important law because it allowed the IRS to receive nearly 80 billion in new funding to help the agency boost up staff and modernize their technology. Some funding was earmarked for hiring more than 5,000 new telephone assisters and additional in-person staff to help taxpayers with their uh, filing this year. The additional workforce that has since joined the agency who have now been there for one year or longer means the IRS is better positioned to help people like you 
filing this season and to start the current tax season stronger. Trust today's presentation will go over information on the most common IRS issues and how you can receive the help you need. I hope you find today's presentation informative and very helpful. In addition to that, uh, again, please, 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 you can ask questions, you can type them in and do not put in your social security number. If you have something specific to your case and you'd like to discuss it directly with my staff, you can call our office to do so at any time. So, but for tonight, you can ask questions and basically describe them to us so that you don't divulge your specific information, but we will answer your questions. I'll leave you with Brenda Lopez to introduce our presenters tonight and also have a great evening and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Congressman, for your remarks. Just a reminder, we'll be doing Q&A after the, after the presentations. If you have a general tax question, please leave your questions in the chat box. I will now give the floor to our guest, Annabelle Marquez from the IRS. Thank you, Congressman Cardenas, and thank you, Brenda. I have to say it's always a pleasure to join you on these efforts to inform your constituents on everything that's going on. And of course, right now we're in the filing season. So um, thank you for inviting me to be a part of this uh, presentation. Um, the Congressman touched on a very important point today, and that is something that's brand new for the agency, brand new for taxpayers all across the country. And that is something that the IRS for the first time has implemented, which is giving taxpayers an option to file directly with the agency. In other words, you don't have to go to a tax preparer, you don't have to go and purchase computer software. For the first time in IRS history, um, we have implemented a system called Direct File, where taxpayers can go directly to the IRS, file their tax returns for free directly with the IRS. Uh, because it's its very first year, it is a pilot program, which means only 12 states um, are participating. Only 12 states right now um, have the option of, of participating in this program. California is one of them. Okay, I started off with direct file because I realized that my presentation uh, doesn't include the slide on direct file, but I can give you a quick um, sort of introduction if I can share my screen in just a few moments so we can talk about it. Um, but it's tax time, and here's a few things you need to know. Of course, as you know, the Taxpayer Advocate Service, the local taxpayer advocate, Luis Tejada, is here today. So he will be going over many of the tax credits that are available this tax season. I'm going to go over an overview um, of the IRS, and I'm also going to touch a little on the energy credits, which are also new for 2023. All right, so next slide, please. Here's a little on the um, agenda for today, IRS filing season update. I'll let you guys know how we're doing so far. We're only a few weeks into the new filing season. Of course, I told you about direct file. Uh, I'll talk on about clean energy incentives for individuals. Choosing a tax preparer, it's always very important. We have very um, key uh, tips for taxpayers, and it happens every year. We're talking about scams. Unfortunately, we'll, we'll talk about what to, what to do to be careful with um, scams going around this time of year. I'll offer a few filing tips, and then I'll show you a graphic with some IRS services and online tools. Of course, later in today's presentation, you'll also hear, like I said, from Lewis from the Taxpayer Advocate Service, and he'll be going over several um, uh, tools that are available for taxpayers. And then I'll open it up for some general questions. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, constituents with questions that are specific to their accounts, to their cases, um, you can refer those to the Congressional Office, to the Congressman Cardenas Office, and then we'll work those after the presentation. Next slide, please. All right, so let's start with a general IRS filing season update. This year's filing season began on January 29th, which was earlier than last year, because last year we started in February. Um, and the deadline is April 15th of 2024. All right, so far things are moving along quite smoothly, no glitches, no big issues that have been reported. For the week ending February 2nd, the IRS has received over 15 million tax returns, of which almost 15 million, 14,900,000 of those have been e-filed. What does that mean? That the majority of taxpayers are choosing to electronically file their tax returns because they know it's safe, 
They know they can get the returns accurately to the IRS. And they also know that they can get their tax refunds faster when they e-file. So far, the average direct deposit refund, uh, and these are, these are national stats. Of course, things vary by state, but we won't have the state statistics until after the filing season. But so far, the average direct deposit refund is $1,543, which we know um, is, is uh, for many taxpayers across the country, it's is, is, is a paycheck they're waiting for all year long. So we're, we're, we're happy to report 15 million uh, returns have been processed and uh, we're just getting started. All right, so at this point, I wanted to see if it's okay for me to share my screen and go a little bit over the direct file and what, what that is, if that's okay. I don't know if that's a possibility or um, because I, before we move on to the rest of the presentation, what do you think, Brenda? Um, yeah, uh, let me stop sharing and I'll, I'll let you do that. Wonderful. So direct file, um, as I mentioned, is brand new this year and it's not yet open for use. Are you able to see my screen now? Yes. Okay. You would visit irs.gov and this is where you find the direct file pilot page. All you have to do is type direct file on the search box and you check your eligibility. So just to see if you're eligible for IRS direct file, you would, you would go to this page, you let them know that you're from California, of course, and then you move on to next. And then it's going to ask that you, whether you have a social security number, an ITIN number, and a, a driver's license, a few other identification numbers. If the answer is yes, you go on to the next one. The direct file program, in order to qualify, you must have a Form W-2. It will also take taxpayers with Forms 1099, uh, Social Security benefits, and as long as you have uh, interest income of $1,500 or less, you are eligible to file directly with IRS using direct file. Direct file at this point in time, because it's so new, all right, can't take itemized deductions, can't take comp you know, complex returns, so to speak. So because it's our first pilot year, as long as you have a Form W-2 and you don't have a complex tax return, you'll be good to go for the direct file program. And basically what I'm showing you here is that intake form. You would answer the questions and if you answer yes, you can move on and um, you know, you can use direct file if you have health insurance, no health insurance, Medicare. However, if you have uh, money that you withdrew from a health savings account, or if you have health insurance that you bought directly through a marketplace like healthcare.gov, then at that point, you wouldn't be eligible for a direct file this year. Um, also, you can use direct file if you want to claim the child tax credit the earned in income tax credit and the credit for other dependents. But if you have any other credits to claim other than those, then this wouldn't be the year quite yet for you to use direct file. Again, it's a pilot program. It's the first year. And for, for such a big undertaking, and as a congressman said, this is all thanks to the Inflation uh, Reduction Act with funding that came in through Congress where we're able to offer taxpayers uh, new options to file their returns um, with IRS. So with that said, that was a brief overview of what it looks like to use the eligibility intake form to see if you can use direct file. It will be available as of March. We understand many taxpayers have already filed their tax returns, um, but if you'd like to see if you can file directly with IRS, we are excited about the program and you would use that eligibility intake form in order to um, see if you can use direct file. All right, so moving right along to my presentation. Um, I think uh, you guys have the screen again, right? It's, I'm good to go. Slide yes. number four. Okay, here we go. So the due date, like I mentioned earlier, is April 15th. Um, standard deduction amounts for this year. All right, so the standard deduction lowers your income by one fixed amount. On the other hand, itemized deductions, those are made up of a list of eligible expenses. So when you file your tax return, you get to choose which type of deduction will benefit you most. Usually taxpayers with uh, W-2 wage earners um, that don't have a business or a side hustle or opt, you know, they would opt for the standard deduction. Um, this year, that standard deduction is $13,850 for single uh, taxpayers or those who file married 
uh, filing separately and the deduction from married filing jointly or qualifying surviving spouses is $27,700. And we see that um, that the deduction did increase uh, from last year, and that was done, um, you know, as a result of inflation. Um, the deduction this year for the standard deduction for head of household is $20,800. All right, let's get into some of the energy credits. And I'm trying to do this as fast as possible because I know we have a limited amount of time. This is important. These are the clean vehicle credits. And um, you, we're really trying to make a lot of information available because there's just a lot and there's different components. So bear with me as I go through some of this information. Uh, again, we can always go back to Congressman Cardenas' office and ask for additional clarification on things if this seems a little too overwhelming or too much. But you can qualify for a credit of up to $7,500 if you buy a new qualified plug-in electric vehicle or a fuel cell electric vehicle, okay? Um, the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022 changed the rules for this credit for vehicles purchased from 2023 until 2032. So this credit is gonna be around for a while. This credit is available to individuals and their businesses. And to qualify, you must have purchased or owned, um, uh, you know, for your own use, you must have purchased for your own use, not, not for resale, but you must have purchased an electric vehicle for you to drive, used it primarily in the U.S., and, um, you know, there's going to be the modified adjusted gross income limitations. Those limitations are considerably high, so uh, we anticipate that many people would qualify for this credit. Um, annual lim income limits for the 7500 New vehicle credit, for example, would be $300,000 for married couples filing a joint tax return. If you're a married couple uh, who, who files some, uh, a, a joint tax return and you have a combined income of more than $300,000, then you wouldn't qualify for the $7,500 uh, new, new clean vehicle credit. Okay, next slide. Now, what if you wanted to buy an electric vehicle, but you just um, maybe couldn't afford to buy a brand new car at a dealership, but you wanted to buy a used car and you can still use the benefits of driving, you know, a clean vehicle. Well, there is something called um, uh, previously owned clean vehicle credit. So this credit is available only for individuals, not for businesses. Um, but beginning January 20, January 1st, 2023, so for all of last year, if you bought a qualified used electric vehicle, or fuel cell vehicle from a licensed dealer for $25,000 or less, you may be eligible for a used clean vehicle tax credit. Um, and the credit equals 30% of the sale price up to a maximum of $4,000. Okay, so the maximum amount you can get for this would be $4,000 for a used clean vehicle that you purchased in 2023 that cost you $25,000 or less. All right, to qualify, you must be an individual who bought the vehicle for your own use, not to resell it. Um, you must not be the original owner. So we, we need to make sure that you actually purchased a used vehicle from someone else. And you can't be claimed as a dependent or another person's on another person's tax return. Um, you also um, may not have claimed the, another used clean vehicle credit in the last three years before the purchase date. So those are the rules for um, a used clean vehicle for those who purchased an electric car that was used in 2023. That's the credit that's available, $4,000, if the, the vehicle must have cost $25,000 or less. Okay, now let's get into some of the home energy credits. All right, these are good to know also. You can claim either the energy efficient home improvement credit or the residential energy clean property credit for the year when you make qualifying improvements. So many of us like to um, you know, upgrade our homes and, and do projects around the house. Well, now we have some credits that you know, may really benefit you. So homeowners who improve their primary residence will find the most opportunities to claim a credit for qualifying expenses. Now, this is what's interesting with uh, home energy tax credits for 2023. Renters may also be able to claim credits. 
um, as well as owners of second homes. For example, you have your own you know, primary residence, but you also have a rental property. Um, if you make improvements that are energy efficient to those other properties that you own other than your primary residence, you may also be eligible to claim these home energy tax credits. And in order to claim these, you have to use form 5695, and that will help you figure um, the amount of credit and then um, you know, take your residential energy credits. Next slide. All right, so here are some expenses for the uh, energy efficient home improvement credit. All right, this is the energy efficient home improvement credit. These expenses may qualify if they meet certain requirements, and these requirements are actually detailed on energy.gov. Important to note, uh, energy.gov will have a listing of um, the expenses, but I can give you, you know, an overview here. We're talking exterior doors, windows, skylights, and insulation materials, central air conditioners, water heaters, furnaces, boilers, and heat pumps, Biomass stoves. I wasn't sure what a biomass stove was. I did a little research. It's this really grand, really modern appliance that's like a stove, but it actually heats up the entire home. You know, it's pretty costly, but these types of things would qualify um, to for you to get the energy efficient home improvement credit. Uh, boilers. And uh, if you uh, you know, sometimes you may have a home energy audit to see uh, the types of improvements that would make your home more energy efficient. Those costs um, can also be included. The amount of the credit you can take is a percentage of the total improvement expense in the year of installation. If for 2023, that would be 30% up to $1,200. Um, now, there's no lifetime limit on this particular credit. What does that mean? That means that uh, even though the credit amounts may change year after year, you can go back every year. And if you're eligible, you can claim the credit again and again, year after year, um, you know, based on what amounts are available, because there's not going to be a lifetime limit to this credit. So um, that's good news for people that want to sort of stagger their home projects. Maybe they did something in 2023. Maybe they want to do uh, a different type of improvement in 2024. Um, rest assured, you'll be able to get the credit again if you make eligible um, improvements. Next slide. All right, we have um, uh, the home energy tax credits. These are, again, expenses that may qualify if they meet requirements detailed, again, on energy.gov. These include solar wind and geo geothermal power generation, solar water heaters, fuel cells, battery storage, and that was new in 2023. All right, the amount of the residential clean energy credit is uh, 30%. Um, let's see, you can, let's see the amount of the credit you can take as a percentage of the total improvement expense in the year of installation. Um, in, in 2022 to 2032, this credit would be 30% with no annual maximum or lifetime limit. Again, a lot of incentives um, to really promote energy efficiency in our homes and in our country. Um, so for those of you who have been considering or have already completed home improvement projects um, that are um, energy efficient, certainly make sure to visit these credits when you go to your tax preparer or when you start preparing your taxes, um, because these would really benefit families. All right, so one very important thing, let's move on to the next slide, that comes up every filing season, as I mentioned earlier, is um, the topic of choosing a tax preparer. Why? Because not all tax preparers are equal. I know that sounds kind of funny and there's most of the tax professionals and the tax professional industry are reliable, um, hardworking, good people, but you have to watch out for those who promise larger than expected refunds. You can't have somebody tell you they're gonna get you a big refund without even taking a look at your tax return and your documents. That's just, you know, red flag alert right away. Um, you know, we get this happening every year and year after year, we have to remind taxpayers, please be very careful with the tax preparer you choose. Sometimes all it takes is a quick Google search 
to see what people have to say about a particular office or tax preparer. For the most part, is we're talking individual tax preparers. Sometimes there's something called ghost preparers, where they'll come around during the tax filing season. Uh, but come April 16th, the day after filing deadline, they're nowhere to be found. So these are the types of preparers that we want to warn taxpayers um, about. So here are some red flags. I mentioned the one where they promise a large refund and they haven't even taken a look at your financial picture. The other one is when they charge fees based on refund percentages. So um, the bigger the refund, then the bigger the fee they can charge makes no sense. Why? Because that would mean they would want to find ways to get you a bigger refund so they can charge a bigger fee. A professional tax preparer will have a very set schedule of fees. They'll know, you'll be able to know up front what they would charge for them to do a 1040, what they would charge if they need to add, you know, attachments to it and extra forms. They'll let you know ahead of time what the cost of the tax preparation service will be. You don't want anybody who tells you, well, I'm going to charge you a percentage of your refund because that may cause um, that, you know, idea to try to get a bigger refund than what you're actually eligible to get. And then unfortunately, you know, we all lose um, you also want to make sure that a tax preparer has a preparer tax identification number, which is a P10. Um, and the preparer that you choose, make sure they sign your tax return and that they give you a copy of your return. At the end of the day, and you know, we say this all the time, and unfortunately, you know, like I said, it happens year after year, especially during the tax filing season when taxes are on a lot of people's minds. Um, you know, the tax preparer will. Um, give you, you know, ask, you know, basically you won't sign your tax return. So then when you have a blank tax return, there's just so much that they can do if, if you haven't signed it. And so you don't want them to manipulate those numbers or anything like that. Um, but you can always ask to verify their credentials. Um, never sign a blank tax form, like I just said. And make sure that you find someone who's always available for follow-up questions. You want them to be around just in case, you know, you have a follow-up question. What if there was something you forgot to include in your return and now you have to um, file an amendment? Well, you would hope to find that tax preparer there to help you without all of that. Um, but the IRS does have something called the Directory of Federal Tax Return Preparers. And this directory is basically a database. You type in your zip code and it gives you a listing of tax preparers with different credentials. So there's obviously some tax preparers that are certified public accountants. You have, you know, a variety of certifications and levels of expertise. And so when you, uh, you use the taxpayer directory, tax preparer directory, federal tax return preparer directory that we have on irs.gov, you can uh, check on your zip code and then find a tax preparer that's near you. So that way um, you find, you know that this is a person that has a prepared tax identification number. They've registered with the IRS. Um, they're doing this in good faith and you can trust that um, you are going with someone who has been registered with the IRS. Next slide. Scams, that's a big deal this time of year, unfortunately. Um, this is different than a tax preparer. A tax, a tax scammer can be anyone. And these are people who unfortunately have caused loss, losses in the millions, all right? These, these tax, scammers, tax scammers um, commit fraud. That's really what they do and they do it year round. But for some reason, we see a peak in these types of crimes during the filing season. Again, um, it's when taxes are on a lot of people's minds, uh, especially this period between February and April 15th. So a few tips here. The IRS does not initiate contact with taxpayers by email, by text message, or social media channels. The IRS will never call demanding an immediate tax payment and specify in which method or form we want that tax payment. The IRS will never say, I need you to deposit or I need you to go to the liquor store, buy a gift card and call me and give me the number to that gift card. It's just the IRS gives taxpayers options to pay their taxes. And there are many, many options to pay taxes, everything from paying with the credit card to setting up a payment plan to uh, we have even um, a partnership with 7-Eleven where you can go in to a 7-Eleven pay your taxes cash through a partnership. And so the IRS would never say you have to pay me uh, taxes immediately and you have to do it this way. So that would be definitely a red, a red flag. That's a scammer. 
And um, oftentimes tax cam tax, uh, this word, the, this, the combination of these two words, tax scammers, will demand that the taxes be paid without giving you the opportunity to question or appeal. And I know Lewis will go over this. Um, there is a um, taxpayer's bill of rights. And one of those rights granted to every single taxpayer in this country is that they have the right to appeal. If you have a question about what the IRS is saying that you owe, if you have a disagreement in what the IRS says you owe, then you have the right to come and say, I don't believe and I don't agree. And this is why I don't believe I owe this. So a tax uh, scammer will obviously not give you a chance to appeal. So that's one thing to keep in mind. All right, so please be very cautious when you're using public Wi-Fi. We always say, um, try not to do that. You know, this is a time to check that when you're using a, you know, public Wi-Fi, that's not the time to check your, your bank or to check anything that requires your personal credentials. Um, don't click on links or texts that arrive claiming to be from IRS. You know, be very careful with that. And, um, you know, make sure that uh, if you do get an email that seems to be legitimate, but you, you know, you just know you weren't expecting anything and it, we, we have an email and I don't have it on here, but it's an email address. It's, a, oh yeah, you see that word phishing? It's uh, phishing at irs.gov. You forward us that and we, we do the research, we investigate what's going on. All right, thank you for that. Next slide. All right, so a few filing tips because I know we're about to get into the really good stuff with Lewis on the credits and all the good stuff that um, you should know for this filing season, but just a few filing tips here. Um, very important that you file a complete and accurate return. We always, IRS always uh, suggests doing it electronically. That way you don't risk losing your paper in the mail, um, your tax, you know, your paper file return. And those also cause delays because those have to be manually processed. Whereas when we get stuff electronically, it's ready and easy to go. Um, most refunds are arriving in less than 21 days when you opt for direct deposit when you file electronically. And, um, you know, IRS may take a little longer to process your return. In if, for example, there's an error, there's, um, you know, a miscalculation of sorts. Um, if the tax return is incomplete or missing signatures, um, if we have reason to believe that um, you might be a victim of identity theft or fraud, that will cause a delay in your refund. We will ask for verification. You know, sometimes our system does things in an automated fashion, right? So when we get a, a tax return that's com that's very different from that taxpayer's information from the year prior, um, that might trigger, you know, a, a suspicious sort of uh, coding for the system. And so we would have to verify with the taxpayer that, in fact, this is, uh, you know, who you are and, and what you're presenting to Eris is, is, in fact, what you uh, earned in the last year and, and you know all of the information you present is accurate. Um, and also if for example, if we require additional review in general, that might delay the refund, but in general, 21 days or less, you can check irs.gov uh, and then look for the tool called Where's My Refund? And Where's My Refund this year has more features added. Before, it used to be a tool that would tell you if we received it, if it's in process, and if you refer, your refund has been issued. Now, the uh, Where's My Tool will actually offer more detailed information, including uh, whether we're waiting on additional information from you. And so always remember we have Where's My Refund, which is a really good tool to check to see where your money is. All right, next slide. Avoid common errors. Um, well, we kind of went over this. Just make sure your information is correct. And for the most part, we have to do, you know, we keep in mind that when you file electronically, it's going to be rather accurate because you're, um, you know, there, there's more of a possibility to commit or to, you know, make an error when you're filling things out by hand. But um, just make sure double check your social security numbers, names, addresses, um, and use the correct filing status. If you are married and you are filing jointly, then you are married. You're not single. You know, making sure you use the correct filing status when you file your return. 
only claim dependents that you're eligible for. I mean, the tax rules are clear. Um, there's rules for claiming dependents. Make sure that uh, they meet those eligibility requirements before you let IRS know that, you know, these were your dependents in 2023. Accurately report your income, your expenses, your deductions. Only claim credits that you qualify for. And of course, um, double check your bank information so that we make sure we have the right information uh, to send your refund. And always a good idea to keep a copy of your return and review it. Um, that way, you know, you have that for your records. All right, next slide, please. Um, after you file, what if you owe? Well, um, there's options, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, IRS always encourages taxpayers to file and pay by the deadline. That's the most important thing. You know, after April 15, there's a few things that start rolling. One of them is interest. The other one is, um, well, there's interest for two different things. You can start getting interest accrued for failure to file and for failure to pay. Um, so we encourage people to just file their tax return on time. If they know they need additional time to file, just request an extension. The IRS doesn't ask any questions. We grant you an automatic six month extension and that gives you more time to gather all your documents um, to make sure you have the most accurate tax return. But we do encourage folks to make a payment as soon as possible, even if they don't have um, their tax return complete. You know, more or less, we, we do anticipate that taxpayers know more or less what their earnings were. So try to make a project projection in terms of what you think your tax bill is and try to make a payment if possible. Um, and well, I mean, other than that, if you can't pay, IRS has options. We have payment plans. Um, we have something called an offer and compromise, which I kind of see as sort of a settlement. You let the agency know, look, I have this tax bill, but if you look at my finances, if you look at my current, you know, um, state of my own personal economy and finances, I, I can't afford to pay this tax bill. The IRS offers programs to help out uh, and make sure we, we close out the account. We're good to go and on to the next. So just never, you know, never hesitate to contact IRS if you need help with um, payments uh, with your tax bill. Uh, we're here to help and we're here to offer options. All right, so we're down to our final slide and I, I'm not sure if I made it and stayed within my 50, allotted 15 minutes, but we have many, many resources available on irs.gov. One of them is, of course, online account. And this is very important for people, uh, especially constituents of Congressman Cardenas. If you have an online account um, and you can go in and check your tax history, it gives you up to five years of all of your tax transactions at the IRS. So this helps avoid time. For example, if you are wondering um, you know, where you can get a transcript, you, you can find all your information on your own without, without having to wait for um, a case to be initiated and then for IRS to research because sometimes online account, having an online account will answer many, many questions that taxpayers have. So you can set one up by visiting irs.gov. We have the interactive tax assistant um, and many other tools. Like I mentioned, where's my refund? We have an IRS services guide. And very important, we have information in many languages, including Spanish and IRS in Spanish is irs.gov forward slash ES for Espanol. And so if you want IRS information in Spanish, um, that is where you can find it. Now, I say next slide, we have reached the end of my quick presentation here. I know it's a lot of information and I was going rather fast. Um, I don't know if at this point is uh, when we're opening up for a few questions or if we wanna move on to our next presenter. I think we're going, um, I think I'm going to move on for right now. And at the end, we'll do some questions. Very good, very good. I didn't realize my camera was not on, but so thank you so much. And this was my portion of it. Um, and I, you know, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Annabelle, for the presentation. Now we'll go ahead and move on to our next presentation. I will now give the floor to our guest, uh, Luis Tejeda from the Taxpayer Advocate Services. 
Okay, thank you, Brenda. And thank you, Congressman Tony Cardenas for allowing us to speak today to all your constituents. Now, we're here to serve you. We provide assistance to all of you. I am your local tax fair advocate, as you can see in this PowerPoint slide. Um, I am available to assist you with my office. We recently hired eight new case advocates to assist everybody in the Southern California area. Uh, Brenda, will you be moving the slides or will I? I can do that for you. Thank you. Next. Okay, we're going to be talking about this year's 2023 tax season. So I will try and go through as much information as I can for you. Next. Annabelle covered this, but um, the due date for our tax returns this year for 2023 is Monday, April 15th. You can file an extension using the form 4868 and ex uh, extend the filing of your return until October 15th, but you still need to pay your taxes on time by April 15th. So please do not um, consider an extension an extension to pay. It is an extension to file the return. If you are in two other states, like the states of Maine and Massachusetts, they have a different due date, but we're all here in California. So our due date is April 15th. Next. The standard deduction is the most common deduction that a lot of taxpayers will take. For single individuals, which is unmarried individuals, the standard deduction is 13,850. And for married filing jointly and a surviving spouse, it is 27,700. There are other amounts for married filing separate and head of household. Next. What I'd like to tell you is that you can add to that standard deduction that I just briefly went over. Uh, for example, an, um, a married individual who is 65 or over, if one of the individuals who is married is 65 or over, they can add 1,500. If both of them are over 65 or over, they can each add 1,500. If uh, one of them is blind and 65 over, you have another 1,500. Another important factor to know is marrying filing separate. A marrying filing separate taxpayer is able to also claim the additional amount for the spouse. As long as that other spouse is not going to file a return, has no income, and cannot be claimed as a dependent on another person's return. They must meet all these requirements in order for the marrying filing separate taxpayer, one of the spouses, to be able to claim the other spouse. But that is a great benefit. Now, for single and head of household taxpayers, the additional amount is different. They can increase their standard deduction by an additional $1,850 if they are 65 or older or they're blind. If they're both 65 or older and they're blind, they're able to add $3,700 which is twice the amount of 1,850. Next. This is a table that just covers what I just went over. That's why I was moving a little quickly just to show you. So for single taxpayers who are, as we describe, unmarried individuals under the age of 65, the standard amount is 13,850. And as I mentioned to you earlier, you can claim up to $1,850 in addition if you are 65 or older. So when you add the $1,850 to the $13,850, you come up with $15,700. Same thing happens for head of household. And as I may, uh, mentioned, for married filing jointly, married filing separate, qualifying widowers, they're able to add $1,500. Next. Okay, there are special rules for single dependents. As you know, we have, uh, for example, most of the time our children that we, we might need want to, if we can qualify them and claim it as a dependent. But there are requirements, there are special rules for them. And they do have to file return. If they have, for example, earned income over 15,700, and if the single dependent is over 65 or older or blind, then if their earned income is over $17,550, they will have to file a return as well. 
Unearned income is also very important. That is income that is not considered wages. That is usually income from investments or from savings. And if your unearned income is over $3,100 as a single dependent, you will have to file a return. As well as if you are 65 or older or blind and you have unearned income that reaches $4,950 and or over, you will have to also file a return. Um, a lot of times, our parents, for example, only receive Social Security benefits. And only half of that amount normally, unless there are other forms of income, could be taxable. But that is why you'll need a tax professional, a tax preparer, or software like what we've been describing to you now that the IRS has set up a new direct pilot program can conduct the calculations for you. But yes, there is a lot of information here and a lot of um, items that you need to consider. We'll move on to the next slide. All right, my final requirements for married dependents as well have its own certain requirements. And as you can see here, the unearned income is actually less if it's over $1,250 or the earned income, that is income earned through W-2 wages or self-employment income is over 12,850, they will have to file a return. Also, marry filing separate returns. Whenever one spouse files a return separately, the other spouse will have to file a return as well, even if they just earn gross income of at least $5. The government, the IRS, will require that both spouses, both parties, file a return, even if their gross income is a uh, very small amount, but it's at least $5. They will have to file a return. Next. Educator expenses is a very interesting area where you can get deductions now as school teachers. These are teachers that cover uh, kindergarten up to K-12 or um, your last year, 12th grade in high school. And also that it must have worked at least 900 hours during a school year. Now, one of the interesting items of educator expenses that we are asked many times, what about if you're a parent that is homeschooling your children? Can you take the educator expenses? Unfortunately, no, you cannot take this deduction. And the deduction is limited. It is not that, you know, uh, uh, dollar for dollar. You are allowed to claim $300, up to $300, of educational expenses, or if you're married and both parties are educators, both are, now just one, then they can claim up to $600. And there are certain expenses that are defined as educator expenses. What I'm gonna just say is non-athletic supplies for courses of instruction in health and physical education, meaning these are the exceptions to the rule, but generally they're books and supplies and any related software, a computer equipment, anything specific like that is going to be deductible. Next. The student loan interest deduction phase out is another area, and it's depending on income. Normally, you can deduct student loan interest as long as your student loan interest and your AGI is not greater than $75,000 for a single person, head of household, but for Mary filing jointly, it can go up to 155,000. The entire amount of student loan interest deduction is phased out completely if your AGI, modified AGI, reaches $90,000 or more, and for a joint return, it reaches $185,000 or more. And the total amount of student loan interest you can deduct, the maximum deduction still remains in 2023 at $2,500. Next. This is an area that is being discussed uh, many times, but one of the great things in 2023, what you need to know, if you receive a Form 1099-K, there is, um, this year in 23, they are waiving this category. It will come into effect in 2024, but they're giving us time because there have been some concerns with the issuance of a 1099-K. What is this 1099-K? This is a form that is being issued by third parties for goods and services that are provided. 
and there is an exchange of money. Now, there have been issues that have been raised in this area because they use this area as well to exchange and pass money to family members that is not taxable. Previously, when the law was initially um, passed, it was to uh, identify taxpayers that were using third-party payment settlement networks like eBay and others in order to exchange and conduct business. And the threshold was $20,000 in gross payments, and they had to participate in more than 200 transactions. But as I said, a lot of people are using these areas also to pass money to friends and family. And that's why it has been way for now. If we go to the next slide, there is an IRS notice 2023-74 that was recently released last year on November 21st, 2023. And they have decided to hold off on this threshold, but beginning in 2024, the threshold will be 5,000, not $20,000. And that's when it will take effect. So we do not at this time need to be as concerned, but whenever you earn income, even if you do receive or don't receive a 1099K, if it is exchange for services and for sale of assets, you might have to pay taxes. There is another form that you can disclose, the 1099-K, and it's on an IRS attached form called the 8949, as well as uh, you can declare it on a Schedule D. I'm moving on. There are a number of refundable credits. I do want to highlight this very quickly. The Earned Income Tax Credit is still a very good credit, refundable credit, in addition to whatever is withheld from your wages that can benefit and help families, as well as the additional, not the child tax credit, but the additional child tax credit is a refundable credit. Ed education credits are also refundable credits. And there's one more called the premium tax credit. Moving on. These are non-refundable credits. If you claim these credits, they can be offset against your taxes and reduce the amount of tax that you owe, which could reduce it to zero. Uh, but if it exceeds the zero, no, you cannot get the excess amount in the refund. No, you cannot. And as I stated, the child tax credit is not refundable. Adoption credit, credit for other dependents, the credit for child and dependent care credit, and the retirement savings contributions credit are not refundable credits. Okay, the next couple of slides, I will try and highlight as much as I can for you as we move forward. This is the Earned Income Tax Credit. What I wanna point out to you that as you have more than one child, or if you have no children, even if you don't have any children, you might be able to qualify for the Earned Income Tax Credit, but there are dollar amounts or threshold amounts on your earned income. So let's pick the one where you have no children. There are individuals out there whose earned income is less than $7,840. Well, they're gonna be eligible to still get an earned income tax credit, even if they have no children, up to $600. And then it increases. For one child, the dollar limit jumps up on how much money you earn in earned income, $11,750. But the credit is also very substantial from no children to one child. It goes up to $3,995. And as you can see, the scale goes up for two and three or more children. Next. These are phase out limits, meaning that not everybody will be eligible to get the earned income tax credit because their earned income starts uh, increasing in amount. And when it gets higher and higher and higher, depending on what phase I'm at level here, then they might not be eligible for the earned income tax credit. But a lot of the software, like the, the direct pilot that Annabelle mentioned, will do these calculations automatically for you. That's what I want to highlight. Next. I mentioned to you this is a refundable tax credit, the additional child tax credit. It is an excellent credit for people to claim when they do have a child. The child in their household, they might be able to claim as much as $1,600 in a refund in addition to their withholding. 
there is a schedule that you must fill out. It's 8812 or 8812. And this is still available for the years 2018, but all the way up to 2025. So for last year, 23, it's available, 24 and 25 at this time. Moving on. I mentioned to you education credits. There are two types of credits available, the American Opportunity Credit and the Lifetime Learning Credit. There are limitations on both credits, but you can claim as much as 2,500 maximum per student under the American Opportunity Credit. And you also have a lifetime learning credit that is up to a maximum of $2,000. And yes, it is limited based on income as well. And it is available still. Um, normally, you get a Form 1098-T from a university, a junior college, a, 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 a institution that qualifies to claim these credits. Next. The next one is a premium tax credit. This premium tax credit deals with qualified health plans that are offered through a marketplace. The credit provides financial assist assistance to pay the premiums for the qualified health plan. So by reducing the amount of the tax owed and giving a refund out or increasing the refund amount, this is a way of assisting the public with the payment of a qualified health plan. Sometimes a lot of people do not have an employer and maybe they're self-employed, they're um, having to uh, get covered California insurance, but this is one way of helping the public. Next. The next one is the child tax credit, which is non-refundable. Thing that I wanna highlight is that the, you can have a qualified child as long as they have not reached the age of 17 by the end of the uh, tax period. So if you have a child who hasn't reached 17 as of December 31st, 2023, they are still qualified for this great credit that offsets against taxes only. And the credit can be as much as $2,000 per child. And a portion of it, a portion of it might be refundable. Next. Child and dependent care credits is another great credit. But one thing I wanna highlight that the child or dependent must be under the age of 13. So it's not all the same for every credit. That's why every credit you have to be very careful and understand what are the qualifications and the requirements. But in this one, it is defined as non-refundable and it is greater than the other credits that I just mentioned. This one can reach up to $300 for qualifying employment related expenses in order to take care of your child while you are working. Uh, if you have two or more qualifying persons, you might be able to qualify for $6,000. And there are limitations due to the AGI, or what we call adjusted gross income, which is a line on the 1040 return. And I apologize for sometimes using acronyms. That's what we do in the government, but I wanted to clarify that. We did mention itemized deductions already. This is the alternative to standard deduction. If your itemized deductions exceeds the standard deductions that I mentioned earlier, then I would recommend doing itemized. But if you cannot exceed the standard deduction, just use the standard deduction. There's less work involved. There's less documentation involved if you claim the standard deduction. If you do itemized, you will have to maintain your receipts and your records just in case the IRS decides to question and ask questions and want verification. Next. Miscellaneous deductions under itemized deductions is where a lot of people will claim other deductions. These include if you do hire someone to prepare your return, you can deduct the fees that you pay the preparer, but they are subject to a 2% adjusted gross income limitation. If you even get advice, you can uh, tax advice, you can claim it here. If you invest money and you have investments, you can deduct the investment fees here. If you have a home office, there are certain limitations, but you might be able to qualify for a home office expenses. But again, I would be cautious, research it, uh, get a tax uh, expert, someone who is knowledgeable in this area and help you with your home office expenses. Next. I'm just gonna highlight real quickly other credits. There are a number of other credits Annabelle mentioned uh, energy credits, uh, clean uh, vehicles, 
She mentioned several of those. Those are listed here as well. There's adoption credits. I want to highlight that for you. Retirement savings contributions credit. Um, there's also additional depreciation. That's that's usually for someone as a business. And we also have moving expense deductions and W-2 reporting for qualify equity grants. So there are a number of other credits available. And moving on, next, and then following the next slide, please. What I just want to highlight, there is now a new tool called the Document Upload Tool. So if you do get questioned, as I mentioned, by the IRS, you receive an IRS notice or a letter from IRS, there is now a better way to communicate with the IRS, thanks to the Secretary of the Treasury, Ms. Uh, Janet Yellen, who announced this, and thanks to Congress as well for the expansion of providing better service to the public due to the Inflation Reduction Act, thanks to Congressman Cardenas for um, helping us, helping the IRS, helping the public out. Due to that Inflation Reduction Act, that money is being used to help you. And this is one of the tools that they have created in order for you now through a link to send responses to those notices and letters. And next slide, I'm now at the end. I just want to tell you that you can uh, submit all types of documents, JPEG, PNG, PDF, and it's up to 15 megabytes or 40 files that can be submitted at one time using the document upload tool. It is a new tool. I want to thank all of you for attending today. Again, I just want to say gracias. We are here to assist you and support you. Thank you, and I pass it back to Brenda. Thank you, Luis, for the presentation. Now we will go ahead and do Q&A. If you have any general questions, please enter it in the chat box and we will try to get as many questions as time allows. First question that we have, can I contribute to traditional IRA when receiving pension payments from employer? Do you want to try answering that, Lewis? I don't know if it's... Mm -hmm. I'm here. Uh, let me see. Put my face up with your face. Yes. Um, if you are an employee of an employer that you are under a pension, um, you are able to have an IRA and you can uh, contribute to an IRA. There are limitations, of course. Uh, the thresholds do increase in time and they go up every year. And this is a way of saving money for retirement purposes. Just remember that on IRAs and on um, a lot of 401k plans that are similar, you must start deducting or taking money out at age 59 and a half. That's when you can take out and, and not be subject to a 10% penalty. But once you reach an, another age, which is 72 and a half, you will be required to take out the uh, required minimum distribution. But that is a great benefit of doing an IRA. There is another one called the Roth IRA, and the Roth IRA is different from the IRA. The IRA is tax deferred when you contribute the money. Roth IRA, you will pay taxes today, but once you retire and you take the money, you don't have to pay taxes at that time. You really have to decide what is best for you and your family you have to decide what is the best investment approach toward retirement. And the government does support in helping you save money for retirement purposes. And that is another option. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Luis. Um, next question. Are we going to have another, another extension this year? Well, I'll take that one. And I think Daisy would probably agree. Um, last year was very unique in that um, FEMA declared a federal disaster because of the flooding that happened in California earlier in the year. And so an extension was granted. Um, as of today, there's there's not been any talks about an extension. We are set for April 15th as a filing deadline this year. Of course, things can happen. We know that we're, in, we're living in times where natural disasters seem to be far more frequent. But um, as, as, as uh, you know, as, as Lewis would probably agree, um, the deadline is April 15th and um, it stands as is. 
Thank, Thank you, Annabelle. You. Yeah, um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I just want to say this. Um, Congressman Cardenas and other Congress um, members are considering and looking into the situation here in California. But as Annabelle has said, our, our deadline right now, our due date is still April 15th. But I would still stay in touch with the media, the news media, and also in touch with uh, Congressman Cardenas' office, like ja uh, Jasmine, Brenda, Sienna, everybody in that office will be in touch if there is a passage of a change in the extension of the law and moving the, the April 15th out. So we're all basically working together and staying and telling everybody you still have to file your return by April 15th, but that might change. It just depends. Thank you. Thank you. Third question. If Congress expands the child tax credit, but I've, I've already filed my taxes, how do I claim the remaining credit I am eligible for? That's a good question. We've been receiving a lot of those questions. Um, the truth is we can't comment on pending legislation. So as long as Congress hasn't officially passed it and ha it hasn't been signed by the president, the rules are, um, you know, you took the child tax credit that you were eligible to receive and it stays as that. However, there are internal discussions going on because the IRS always has to prepare for these types of changes. We don't have an answer. We can't tell you yet whether this would require an amendment or whether we would do automatic controls that would just sort of adjust your account. But when and if we get to that point, I will make sure to pass along the information to Congressman Cardenas' office. And Lewis will, of course, also be on hand to answer questions from constituents since he's the one that deals directly with account-related matters. Thank you. We're getting close to the end of the event. We'll do two more questions before ending the webinar. Uh, next question. Can I claim the child tax credit with an ITIN? You want to take that one, Lewis? You're taking, I'm coughing right now. Sorry about that. All right, so the child tax credit. Um, you need the social security number for the child tax credit. Um, that's one of the rules um, that's currently in place. You know, there um, it's always been one of those issues where, you know, that would require sort of like a change um, at the tax law level. But in order to claim the child tax credit, you do need to have a social security number for the dependent. Yeah, thank you, Annabelle. That's been a question asked many times. And yes, you have to have a social security number for the child. Thank you. Um, next question, are federal student loans that are forgiven considered taxable income? The quick answer is no. If they are officially forgiven, Okay, and um, and uh, it's within the passage of the law because that that was happening, it wouldn't be taxable now. And I understand the question, you know, because there are certain debts that, uh, when forgiven, um, can become taxable income. Um, but of course, with the federal student loans, as well as we saw several years ago with you know, the housing crisis, um, your elected officials will get to work and work and, and make sure that, um, you know, it, it's not like a, a sort of, um, what is it, what is, what is the term where, you know, you're, you're already going through something and it, you know, they, they work to make sure that taxpayers that are affected by these situations don't get um, that extra charge, so to speak. So, um, you know, at, at this point, uh, Lewis's answer is, is, is what it is. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we're going to do just one more question. Um, this March, I'm turning 18, but I have an internship that pays 300 a month for four months. Do I have to file taxes for an internship, especially since the whole internship pays a stipend of 1200 for the quarter? And I only work for the quarter. That's a great question, um, meaning 
You have to consider also what's going to happen. Is that person going to be claimed as a dependent on someone else's return or not? That's a big question that needs to be answered. Um, I went kind of through the thresholds of that. And sometimes, you know, if you have withholding, even if it's a small amount, you'll want to file a return because you might be entitled to get that money back. So it depends on the stipend and what is taking place. I just can't give you a straight yes or no answer. It really depends on what is happening to them. Whoever is uh, their parents, are they claiming that person? Uh, was there any withholding taken out? Is there any other form of income they have? Um, all that needs to be considered. Thank you. Thank you, Annabelle, Luis, and Congressman, and thank you all for joining us. I hope you found this text webinar helpful and informative. Please don't hesitate to call our district office at 818-221-3718. If you need help with the IRS or with any federal agency, our office is here to help. Thank you.